Father God, I thank you again for this beautiful day. What a glorious day to celebrate your resurrection and all that it means, Lord. Your victory, new life. Lord, we thank you. Lord, as we gather together, we pray for your hand over our time. We pray over our health, our safety. You would ease concerns and worries. And that, Lord, we can just sit at your feet, hear your voice, and glorify your name. And your Holy Spirit speak to us as we gather together, whether we're here in person, whether we're watching online or on video, whatever it may be, Lord. May your Spirit speak. And we thank you and give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, so today is a celebration of the new. We're going to celebrate newness today. How many of you enjoy new things or new experiences? If you say you get a thrill on new things, any shoppers here? Any of you like shopping? All right, do you like the thrill of new clothes? You wear new clothes for the first time or new shoes? Some of you may be collectors of shoes, so you get a kick, no pun intended, on getting new shoes. Right, maybe you like that. Any of you like tech people? You, like, you get a thrill from getting a new computer? Or a new phone, is that thrilling? I got a new computer recently, that, is, that was thrilling, I must say, after many years. Um, new things, we, we enjoy new things, new experiences. How many of you can remember when you first tasted something new? You tasted something new for the first time, do you remember that maybe it was like an explosion of taste in your mouth? Something totally different you've never experienced before? New experiences can certainly be exciting. How about um, maybe moving into somewhere, getting a new home, that feeling of newness where you can begin to place your things, or you get maybe a, a new start, a new beginning. Maybe you've been in debt and you paid that last payment and you're debt free and it's like a new start. Right? New experiences can be exciting. I don't know about you, but maybe this is just a pastor thing. I don't think, but how do you enjoy getting a new Bible? Do you know what I mean? The sound, some of you are like, no. But there's a sound to new pages turning. I got a new Bible recently that I'm afraid to use it because I like the sound of new pages of a Bible turning. But there's a thrill and enjoyment about new things. But we may not, not everybody here may enjoy new things. Some people are a little hesitant about new things. Some people may fear new things. Maybe it's because they're so used to things, do, doing things a certain way, they're afraid of doing new things. Some are afraid of taking new routes. Any of you like that? You get paranoid about taking a different route? Did you all take the same route to get here, I assume? Do you freak out when there's a road closure, an exit closure, and you're like, oh, what am I going to do? My route's not the same. I have to make changes. Some prefer doing things the same way every time. How many of you are creatures of routine? That you have to do things a certain way all the time. Or maybe you're afraid of new tastes. How many of you are adventurous eaters? All right, there's some of you. How many of you are not so adventurous eaters? It's kind of funny, I'm an adventurous eater, but when it comes to food, I get a little hesitant about trying new things because I don't want to ruin the experience. Like, uh, I'm a big fan of Mexican food, and I'm sure there's a lot of things on the menu that I'd like, but I always stick to the same things because I know I'll like it, and I'm hesitant to try new flavors, new experiences. And we can get that way sometimes when it comes to new things. We're used to doing things a certain way. We like things how we like them, and we get a little hesitant. Some don't like big changes. I think a lot of times people are uncomfortable with change. Maybe you're that way. You get a little uncomfortable with change. You fear maybe a failure. What if I try something new and I fail? Some people fear the unknown. Well, I don't know what it's gonna be like, so I get scared. 
Some people fear the new because they're afraid of what they're going to have to sacrifice. Maybe what they're going to have to leave behind. So some of us, we get excited about new things. There may be some of us who get very scared about new things. We don't want to try new things. We like things the way they are. Well, today we are celebrating newness, new relationships, new beginnings. And it's not about our new beginning, our new relationships. The newness that we're celebrating is something much grander much more meaningful. And for us as believers in Christ, we understand what that newness is. We're celebrating the victorious King, the risen Lord, the one who we recognized Friday that died for our sin. But today we are, we are celebrating victory as our risen Lord. We're celebrating new life that he has given us through his resurrection. And while the rest of the world, the unbelieving world, may look at us and may mock us or may find what we're celebrating today is ridiculous, we know today is more than just about bunny rabbits and egg hunts. It's so much more meaningful than that. And we're going to take a look at not only the story, the narrative story of the resurrection, but the story behind the story the full meaning of why we celebrate today. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Luke, Luke chapter 24. If you have, if you scanned your announcements on your phones, it, it should be there. Your verses should be there. If you have neither, you can use your phone to see the verses if you'd like. But we'll start in Luke chapter 24. Verses 1 it goes like this. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. We'll stop right there. Now, prior to this passage, these women, they were witnesses. They witnessed Jesus getting beaten brutalized, crucified on the cross, taken down. They witnessed Jesus being entombed in the tomb that Joseph Arimathea provided. So they saw their teacher, their beloved teacher, whom they assumed was going to be the Messiah, crucified and entombed. But to their surprise, the tomb was empty. Now, should they have been surprised? Because Jesus revealed to his, his close followers, he told them what was going to take place. They told, he told them he was going to be arrested. He was going to be crucified. He was going to die, but he was going to rise again. But perhaps they didn't conceive it. Perhaps at the moment when Jesus was telling them, they couldn't fathom that their beloved teacher could possibly be taken away. Maybe they thought, oh, maybe he's exaggerating. Maybe he's telling a parable. Perhaps they didn't take him seriously. But look what happens in verse four. And it happened that while they were perplexed about this, behold, two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling apparel. And as the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. So here we see two angels suddenly appear before the women and ask them one of my favorite lines of the resurrection story. I love this line, what they ask them. They ask them, why do you seek the living among the dead? I love the sound of that. In other words, what are you doing here? Why are you seeking the living among the dead? Don't you remember? Remember what Jesus said to you? Remember what he said, what would happen? 
Verse 8, and they remembered his words and returned from the tomb and reported all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now they were Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James. Also the other women with them were telling these things to the apostles and these words appeared to them as nonsense and they would not believe them. Now understand in the context of the time, the culture of the time, when women reported something, it wasn't always taken so seriously. Men didn't always believe the words of their report. So their report would have been easily doubted. So it's not unusual if the disciples heard these women report things, they didn't necessarily take it so seriously. Maybe they dismissed it too easily. But what makes the, the doubts of the 11, those 11 men, those disciples who closely followed Jesus, what made their doubts so remarkable is that they should have remembered. Perhaps they didn't, also didn't take Jesus' words so seriously. Maybe they did forget among the many different things. I don't know how you could forget. I think that's a kind of important thing to remember. But perhaps they didn't take his words so seriously. What's interesting, who did take Jesus' word seriously? Religious leaders, didn't they? They heard, they remember what Jesus declared. They knew what Jesus said, that after three days he will rise again. Maybe they didn't believe him, but they took his word seriously. So what did they do? They made sure there was Roman soldiers guarding the tomb so that no one would take Jesus' body. As you read the story further, the gospel accounts show that Jesus indeed, not only did the, did the women see an empty tomb, but they saw the risen Lord. Jesus did appear to the 11. They saw with their own eyes. They touched with their own hands. They heard with their own ears that indeed their teacher indeed is the risen Messiah, the risen King, the risen Lord. All their doubts were erased. Their, their, their doubts, their, their belief was shattered at the cross, but miraculously revived as they saw their risen Lord. And there was no doubt in their minds. So much so that their life drastically changed after that. Their life changed drastically, so much so that they were willing to not only change their life, but give up their life, literally. Now, would you give up your life for something or someone you knew wasn't true? Think about it. If it was a lie, would you perpetuate that lie knowing it was a lie? They saw the risen Lord. They heard the risen Lord. I want to go back to that quote from the angel when he says, why do you seek the living among the dead? The reason why I like that quote, because I take a, 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 another meaning behind that, not only literally that Jesus was living, but also that, that idea of that, why are you seeking the living among the dead? See, there's, a, there's a important themes throughout scripture. The old and new is an important theme. The living and dead, life and death are important themes throughout scripture, but specifically, especially in the Christian faith. Life and death give special means or special themes throughout scripture. The Bible says that outside of Christ, people are dead in their sins. Romans 8, chapter 8, verse 6, Romans 8, 6 through 8 says, For the mind set on the flesh is death. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. When your mind is set on the flesh, in other words, you're living for your own desires, you cannot please God. Outside of God, we're living for ourselves. We're in pursuit of the world's desires, worldly desires, what we desire naturally in our flesh. And when we set our minds on those things, we cannot please God. And it says the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God. Not only can we not please God, 
but it's in hostility. It's in direct opposition of God. And those who are in the flesh cannot please him. I like that, that statement by the angels because it very much represents the world we live in. So many people are searching for life, something that will give them life, something that will instill meaning and purpose in their life. But the sad thing is so many people are searching among the fellow dead. They're searching for the one thing or the one person that will give them life. But the one person that can give them life is the one that they reject the most. The world, they will search for anyone or anything to give them life except the very one who can in Jesus Christ. How many have ever been lost before? Maybe driving or you went somewhere new, you're a tourist and you're looking for directions, searching all over the place. You literally look like a tourist. You have the map or your phone. And you're looking everywhere like this. Have you ever seen other people who are lost also? When you're lost, who do you go to for guidance and direction? Do you go to people who are lost? Say, are you lost? Me too. Can we be lost together? Can we help each other go astray? Do we do that? Usually you want to find a local, someone who knows the directions, right? When you're dying, do you go to the person or the resource that can help in life? Or someone who's already dying and has no hope? See, the world, the world is searching for what will give them life, the one who will give them life. But the sad thing is, is they're all searching together. That just leads them to death. The one who could give life is the very one the world rejects. And we read this story, but what's the meaning behind the story? We see our Jesus rose again in the empty tomb. But we celebrate more than just a story. We celebrate much more than just a historical event. We celebrate a life changing realization, dynamic. Again, if you have your Bibles, again, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 through 21. The Apostle Paul illustrates exactly what happens on the cross. He says in verse 14, For the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all, that they who live shall no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Skip to verse 17. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were entreating through us we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. See what Paul's saying here. Out of God's great love, Jesus paid the price, took our place on that cross, and received the victory, and we received the reward. Last week, Pastor Andy mentioned the Super Bowl, last Super Bowl, Tampa Bay Buccaneers won the Super Bowl. I'm not going to think about that. I'm not a big Tom Brady fan. I'm sorry. Uh, Lakers won the championship. Okay, I'll use that last year. Those players who played the game, who played the series, they earned the victory. But there were people on that team who didn't play a minute or a meaningful minute on that championship game. 
but they're no less champions, right? They may not have played, but they were champions. That's not a great analogy, but think about this. What Jesus did on the cross was on our behalf. He paid the price. He was the victorious one, and we received the reward. What a great blessing. To have faith in Christ is to accept, believe, and respond to the fact that Jesus took your sinfulness on that cross. Your old self, the one that could not please God, that naturally just does things in opposition of God, died on that cross. Your old self was entombed, was buried. But your new self rises in victory through that empty tomb. You see the meaning? Sin broke our possibility to have a relationship with God, but Jesus' mission was reconciliation. He went to that cross and rose again because he wanted to reconcile us to the Father. How many have ever experienced a broken relationship with somebody? Maybe that broken relationship still exists. Reconciliation hasn't been made yet. Maybe you understand that. Maybe you understand or maybe you already you currently feel the pain of that lack of reconciliation. Things just aren't the same. Take that pain or that experience and you can, you can appreciate the glimpse of what Jesus did for us. He reconciled us to the Father, the Creator, the one that on our own, we could not reconcile ourselves alone without what he did for us. And he says, I will reconcile you to the Father. Do you see the game changer, what, the, the, what we celebrate today, what we celebrate this weekend was? It's not only a game changer, it's a life changer. The cross and the empty tomb represents new life, new relationship with you and the Father, a new purpose for you. When we accept Christ and we have faith in what he's done, we're not just accepting what he did, but we're accepting also what he has given us, what he presents to us. Verse 15 again, he says, and he died for all that they who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. The cross, the change the cross causes in our life ought to be drastic because Jesus took drastic measures to change our life. Again, I'll say that again. The change the cross causes in our life ought to be drastic because he took drastic measures to change our life. Our life now belongs to him. Again, we're not just believing something happened, but we're accepting and saying, Lord, I accept that you give me new life. And that's what I want. See what the Lord does, what he's saying, a new life, new relationship, new purpose is he wants to recalibrate our life. Our mind that was set on the flesh before that couldn't help but want to do what our natural desires wants, wants to do whatever the world is doing. The Lord says, I want to recalibrate your thinking, your mindset, your focus, your vision, how you see life, how you see others. I want to recalibrate it and change it. Give us a life that's greater than our own. Now I want to take a moment as we start to wind down for a second, I want to take a moment to talk to those Christians, the believers who have been a Christian long enough that the newness of the gospel maybe doesn't seem so new anymore. Maybe you've been a Christian long enough, you've been in enough Easter services, maybe the newness has worn off a bit. What do you do when the newness fades, right? New feelings fade, don't they? New clothes wear, you get the wear and tear, they don't feel as new anymore, right? We get used to things, right? What was once a new experience, you get used to it. Then it becomes the same old, same old, right? Maybe new smells, new tastes become ordinary. 
You've been used to it. Now it's just one of the many things you try to eat. New experience become routine. What do you do? For those of you who maybe the new experience of the gospel is not quite new anymore. Well, I want to just give you this reminder, this warning. The grass is never greener on the other side of the Lord's boundaries. The grass is never greener on the other side of the Lord's borders. We may look, we've been a Christian long enough, we may look longly, longingly at everybody else and man, gosh, but that looks so much fun. Look what they have. Their life looks so more enjoyable. Let me talk to those of us who feel that way. Here's four E's to consider. Four E's. Evaluate, embrace, expand, and expect. Evaluate, embrace, expand, and expect. First, evaluate the cost. If you find yourself feeling like the newness of being a Christian has worn down, evaluate the cost. Remember the cost of your redemption. So usually when we buy something, we invest in something, the value decreases over time, right? You buy a new car, as soon as you drive out of that lot, the value decreases. But with Christ's redemption, it only increases in value over time. You know why? Because even though we become a Christian, even though we're saved, what do we do? We still mess up, right? We still sin. And if God were to keep a tally or a tab of our sins, it would just increase if he didn't just take it away wholly. We forget sometimes the value or the cost of what Jesus did for us. Evaluate the cost. Don't underestimate it. Second thing, embrace the new. Embrace the new. If you find yourself like you're scared, you're hesitant to be new, a new person. What would people think of me? What would my friends think of me? What would my family think of me? What if the new means making a course, a change in course in life? What, if, what do I have to leave behind because God is have asking me to step out of what I've always known. Maybe the newness is worn out because you haven't fully embraced the new that God has for you. You've been trying to play both sides. Not only embrace the new, but don't revive what is already dead. Don't try to keep reviving it. As Jesus, our old self is dead on the cross, too many times we go back to our old self and try to resuscitate it. We try to bring in life so that we can be that again. Just says, leave that behind. Leave what the old was dead as dead. Don't let fear keep you from the new that God has for you. Maybe it doesn't feel as new as because you haven't fully taken those steps into the newness that God may have for you. The third thing, expand. Expand beyond the temporal towards eternity. Expand your view. What you live for the here and now, expand your viewpoint for, the, for eternity. Realize that your purpose goes beyond the here and now. It can reap rewards beyond to eternity. Maybe it's someone else's salvation. Maybe it's someone else's eternity. Maybe it's the fact that God wants to bless you, not just to hear, but also for eternity. Why we can get wrapped up in our retirement savings, our 401ks, what we've saved up for that moment of retirement. But you guys know that our retirement isn't just here on earth, right? After you retire, we're going to die eventually at some point. And we're going to face God. And you know that God wants to bless us. He wants to bless us for how we lived our lives, what we did for him, how we used our resources, all that he's blessed us with. He's going to say, what, how did you live your life? Did you live for me? Let me bless you. But we get so caught up in the here and now, living for the here and now, we forget the eternity. So expand your, 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 your vision, your eyes, your goal, your purpose beyond the here and now and into eternity. 
And the fourth thing, expect more than a boring God. Do you have a boring idea of God? Now, I've got to admit, I'm guilty of this sometimes. Not because I think God's boring, but my expectations of what God can do is way too low. Perhaps your life, your walk with God seems a little boring because your expectations of God is a little boring. Maybe you're too afraid for God to do too much exciting things in your life because you're afraid of what that might mean. What changes will that mean? If that means I have to sacrifice this, then oh, I don't know if I'm ready for that. Do we have a boring expectation of God? Because I'm going to challenge you with this, with a warning. If you think your relationship with God, the newness has faded, or you think it's a little boring, I will challenge you and dare you to pray, God, can you help make my life a little more exciting? How many of you have ever prayed that? How many of you have regretted praying that? Because <laughs> you're faced with the fact that, all right, God must say, all right, let's get to work. Let's see. Let's see what we can do. We celebrate newness today. New life. New relationship with God. For most of us here, we know what that means. The Lord is our Savior. We believe that he died and rose again. That's undisputed for us. And we can celebrate the victorious king who's given us new life, who's forgiven our sin. Maybe some of us here, we have, but maybe that newness has kind of faded. Or maybe that, that idea of reconciliation with God hits us home because there's some things that we need to be reconciled to. Our lives aren't what they're supposed to be. We're living a life in a way that, you know what, doesn't resemble what Christ did for us on the cross. And maybe some of us here today have never made that decision. To truly not just believe that Jesus existed, but he died. He died for our sin. He rose from the grave to give us new life and made that decision. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to give my life to you. I want that new life. I want to be reconciled to the Father. I'll, I'll conclude with the words the Apostle Paul says in verse 20. He says, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. I love that. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Let's bow our heads. Let's just take a moment. I recognize that life can take a toll on us sometimes. We feel the wear and tear in life. We bear the burdens of life. Sometimes we could take today for granted. We could take what Jesus did for us for granted. We want to acknowledge that Jesus died for us and, and forgive us our sins and forgive us of all the things we've done wrong and to give us new relationship with him. But some of us may feel we're, we're a little hesitant, we're a little scared of the idea of following him, surrendering our life to him. Maybe we're afraid of the change. We're scared of what that may mean, what that may represent. Some of us here may need to be reconciled to God for the first time. You've been living your life the way you want to live, the way the world tells you to live. And you recognize, I need to be reconciled to the Father. I need forgiveness.
Lord, I pray for anyone who's here or who's watching or listening. The Lord is speaking to you and you need to be reconciled to the Father. It's simple. Just pray to him. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Savior who died for our sin, for my sin, that I may be forgiven. I believe that you are the risen Lord. And just as you rose again, I too can have new life. That I can be reconciled to the Father. May your Holy Spirit come in my life and give me new life and new purpose. If the Lord is speaking to you and, and has been speaking to you about some changes that you need to make. You're a believer, but you've been hesitant. Hesitant to make those changes. Hesitant to leave behind what you know needs to be left behind. Lord, I pray that you give them the boldness, the faith, and the trust in you to take those steps and embrace what you have before them all the new that you have set before them. And Lord, if we pray that we can live our lives as a celebration of the victorious one, the victorious king who's given us new life. We give you praise, Jesus. We celebrate you today and we thank you for you are awesome, glorious, and amazing. We love you, Jesus, in your name. Amen.